everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Creating the Ultimate B2B Experience in the Technology Sector. I'm your moderator, Zoe Fernandez from Merkel's Marketing Team. Before I introduce our speakers and we get to the webinar content, I'd like to share some key housekeeping items for you to keep in mind throughout today's webinar. The console you're looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows you have open. Please ask questions throughout the webinar as we'd love to hear from you. To ask a question, please submit them by clicking on the Q&A icon on your screen, entering your question, and hitting send. If we don't get to your question today, we will follow up with you in the coming days. And if you'd like to revisit today's webinar, a recorded version will be emailed to you. And lastly, resources related to this webinar can be found at the bottom of your screen. Please take a look to learn more. Today, we are joined by three industry experts. Oliver Truman, Head of Research and Analytics at B2B International. Danielle Block, Enterprise Growth Leader at Merkel. And Gavin Mackey, who leads Brand Strategy at Gyro. And now I'm going to hand over to Danielle to get us started. Thank you, Zoe. I'm Danielle Block, and I've been with Merkel for six years focused in B2B, uh, in the B2B space. And today I'm here to talk to you about why we did this piece of research and why now. At the end of last year, we saw a need in the marketplace for a full service B2B demand gen agency. And we launched Merkel B2B, pulling together the best of Dentsu's assets across the globe and B2B experts uh, across Merkel, DWA, Gyro, B2BI, and Digital Pi. And today, we are here to talk to you about architecting the ultimate B2B experience. We know that customer, expecta customer expectations are changing at a rapid pace. And we're here to share insights and findings about underlying drivers of B2B decision makers. What superpowers and characteristics are leading B2B brands using to engage buyers? Uh, in a moment, I'll hand it off to Oliver to go over the research methodology, sample size, headlines, and key insights. But first, why this research and why now? We've noticed trends in the marketplace, so the consumerization of B2B. There are expectations are inflating at a rapid rate. You're no longer competing with every, every brand in your category, but you're competing with every experience your customer has. They're pulling their consumer expectations into the B2B space, and they expect that experiences will be relevant, will resonate, and will be personalized to them. We must create world-class and relevant experiences, and we need to know how to do that. There's increased complexity. So there's a rapid increase in innovation, data, the number of touch points and experiences your customer has on their purchase journey before they make a decision and we must succeed with limited resources. So there's no silver bullet here, but emotional equity built over time and through all the different moments and interaction points you have with your customers and prospects will be meaningful and will start to form loyal relationships over time. So this research is intended to help you understand the mindsets, pain points, and align meaningful messaging and expectations throughout all of your different interaction points with customers. So what are the key ingredients in creating the ultimate B2B experience? Handing it off to Oliver to find out. Thank you very much, Danielle. Um, and thank you to everybody who's been able to find the time to join this webinar today, or indeed, um, if you're consuming the recording of this. So in the next half an hour or so, I'll be leading you through the research that we conducted, um, where it came from, um, what the intent of it was, um, and also what this superpowers model is all about, um, and hopefully how you can start to apply this model within your day-to-day -day work. We'll also, as we go through today, be calling out some examples of brands, particularly those in the tech space, that we think are doing things well. Um, they might be exemplars to hold up for us to follow. Um, so hopefully grounding some of these research results um, in real day-to-day -day action that's being taken. I'll be, first of all, giving you some background to the research um, before moving on to really trying to understand how it is that um, tech companies in the B2B space are working right now. So what is their current experience that people who are in the market are, are seeing right now? And that gives us a, a sort of a diagnosis of what's going on, but also where brands can improve, where they can optimize the current experience. 
But we're also interested in opportunities, uh, particularly two points. One is where um, brands within the tech space can learn from other brands um, uh, and what they're doing well. And we'll be calling out some examples of those, as I've said. But also opportunities for disruption, um, new ways of doing things, particularly new ways that are obviously enabled by digital technology that can get brands to think slightly differently uh, about how they approach their category. And not least um, the fact that this research was conducted not just within the technology market, but also other B2B markets that allows us to take learnings from those and apply them to other analogous situations. So that's the plan. Um, I'll get first of all into the research itself and how it was all set up. So um, this research um, had its genesis in a piece of work that we as B2B International have been conducting now for a few years, which is looking at some of the drivers of B2B decision making. We've historically called it our state of B2B study. And this year, for all of the reasons that Danielle set out, we thought there was a fantastic opportunity to look at this topic afresh, um, to really start to be quite open-minded about all of the drivers that can be impacting on a B2B buyer's decision-making process. So we went out and we conducted lots of uh, primary research, lots of uh, individual interviews, um, and globally we conducted over 3,000 interviews with buyers of a range of different solutions. Um, one of which was the category of technology. Now, although today we'll be looking in general terms at technology, um, there were several sub-verticals within that that we'll briefly see the results for, but which are included within the results. So we had within there uh, software and software as a service brands, uh, we had telecoms firms, we had more traditional hardware-based companies, and we also had um, the growing and influential category of cloud service providers as part of the mix. Um, Nonetheless, a very interesting range of results that we think apply to the whole of the technology sector that we'll be reviewing with you today. And you can see also from this chart that it was global research. We covered um, both APAC and Europe and also North America um, in good numbers. Uh, and certainly the technology of the results that we'll be sharing with you today include all of those um, geographies. The other thing just briefly worth mentioning here is that we uh, were interested as we went through the research that we conducted in trying to understand the experiences that people had had with technology brands. Um, so we asked them to score their experiences on a, a classic market research type scale. But we also collected as part of that study all sorts of other background information, things that we can slice and dice the data by, that we'll be looking at as we walk through the findings today. Um, and we'll be alluding to those at various points. So a huge amount of data, uh, a huge amount of data to feed into what we think is a, a useful and meaningful contribution to understanding the B2B purchasing process. And in order to facilitate that, we asked all of the respondents to our survey, um, a survey which fielded in the mid part of last year, um, a range of different experiences that they had across a classic B2B buyer journey. So we can see here moving from the bottom left through to the top right the different stages of that journey um, going from when a buyer might be conducting research into the sorts of brands that they might want to do business with then the buyer uh, moving towards selecting and making a short list of poten potential uh, suppliers or vendors it's looking at and then actually getting in contact and getting in touch with those vendors through eventually to the point at which a specific brand is selected for a, a particular requirement and then following that through as somebody is onboarded as a customer to hopefully the point at which somebody is repurchasing and purchasing more from that particular brand. And what we did as part of our analysis was to look at the things that make a difference between the different parts of that journey. So um, if somebody is going from the point of researching a brand through to them making the shortlist, um, what were the factors or the considerations that caused somebody to, somebody to make that next step in the journey for a particular brand or for them to drop out of that journey. And we conducted a series of different statistical analyses, a series for those who are interested, a series of regression models to look at the key ingredients, the key factors that make a difference between those points in the process. And it's that that we'll be sharing with you today, not just what it is that makes a difference in general terms, but where it is in the purchase process um, that the buyer is really valuing those sorts of things or indeed where there may be opportunities for making things better. 
Now, we, we will look in very shortly at the range of different things that we might consider to be value drivers as part of the B2B purchase decision-making process, and particularly for those in the tech sector. And we boiled that down to a, a list of 30 different value drivers that we see as being particularly salient across a range of B2B markets. And that list of 30 ingredients, um, as we're going to be calling them, was um, put together from quite extensive desk research, from reviews of previous research that we have done as B2B International, um, the world's leading market research firm for business to business markets, the many thousands of studies that we've done, has taught us an awful lot about what it is that buyers value uh, and what they want to experience. So we had a long list of about 100 different things, first of all, and we whittled that down both through analysis and also through common sense, to be perfectly honest about it, uh, to the things that we've uh, thought would make the biggest difference to B2B buyers. And we'll be reviewing what some of those things are as we get into the relevant sections. So that was the journey that we asked people to retrace as part of our research. So as I've mentioned, um, what is it that B2B buyers and particularly those in the tech space are currently experiencing? Um, what, what are the ways in which they uh, are receiving service from suppliers, the ways in which they're interacting with those brands uh, that we can learn from? What, what is a framework perhaps for us being able to understand these different ideas? Well, um, for those of you who um, have read ahead and um, have seen the superpowers um, model in, in action, um, what we're positing here is two different levels of drivers um, that are important for us to consider. We have, first of all, the company level drivers um, of the ultimate B2B customer experience. That is those things that are not uh, immediately important to the individual making the decision, but which are important to the needs and requirements of the organization that is making the purchase. Um, so this at the very base level includes all sorts of hygiene factors or table stakes type factors that we are terming to be the reliability superpower. That is essentially the ability for a brand to be the sort of brand that can be trusted to deliver. Um, this is about having the right pricing. It's about making sure that you can uh, stick to quality standards. It's making sure that regulations are adhered to. Uh, and we would hope for the most part that those sorts of things are well delivered in most markets. We still see very shortly that there's a short list of things that companies, including within the tech space, are not particularly doing well in that area. And we'll dig into some of the reasons why that's the case and how that might be linking to some of the marketing activities that those companies are putting out there. We move then on to the second of our superpowers, still at this company level, uh, and this is all about the understanding superpower. So the extent to which um, the organization um, that is seeking to do business with a particular brand or vendor um, is understood. Um, the extent to which they are working on the same wavelength, that they're understood in a kind of deeper way than perhaps a very, very superficial level. This includes things such as not just the ability to support the organization and to diagnose what their key requirements or problems are, but it's also about the product mix. It's about having the right sorts of um, uh, SKUs, the right variety and choice, the right tiers or subscription levels if somebody's involved in the software as a service market. Um, it's also, though, increasingly about a degree of cultural alignment. And we'll see shortly the ways in which organizations are either delivering or not delivering against those expectations. But beyond that, one of the key things that we found from our research was that there's a series of other things that make a real difference, things that make a difference to the individual making the purchase decision. Um, so this works in, again, two different ways. And the third of our superpowers is about those sorts of value drivers that enrich the individual making the decision. Um, in, in, in very simple terms, they make the work life of that individual better, easier, um, you know, more, more tolerable in, in some ways um, than would otherwise be the case. And we can see here that these include so the sorts of issues like uh, making it easy for the individual to uh, recommend a particular brand within their organization. So it's not, not an in, a hard internal sell in many ways for them. The extent to which brands um, offer some degree of value exchange with individuals. Um, an example of that might be the extent to which they help an individual with learning new skills or new experiences. 
or just at a very simple level, the extent to which um, a brand is able to make somebody's work life more enjoyable, um, not just avoiding pain points, but at injecting a little bit of fun into the process along the way. Uh, we found that all of these are important and we'll see again shortly where on the process those have most sway. And then the final of our superpowers is that of preeminence. Um, in effect, the reflected glory that a buyer of um, particular services in the tech space gets a reflected glory of working with that brand. So um, this might include the extent to which that brand is respected generally as being an innovator um, or as being a thought leader in their category. But it is also increasingly about the extent to which that brand um, aligns with the attitudes and worldview of the um, business at large and the individuals in that business by extension. And again, we'll see the exact ways in which that is starting to impact upon decisions in the technology space and where there may be work that is still to be done. So those are our superpowers. We have four of them, reliability, understanding, enrichment, and preeminence. The next level down that we'll be reviewing um, on the next few slides is those 30 value drivers that I drew your attention to, those ingredients of customer experience that we really think are the, um, well, the, the, the key points that we need to be thinking about as marketers as we're building out those experiences. Now, one of the key uh, things that I mentioned earlier um, about this research is that it allows us to not just understand what those ingredients are um, and uh, the extent to which those are important within a given category or market, but where in the process those are meaningful or impactful. So this chart here shows us in the rows the different individual ingredients that make a meaningful difference to the company or the buyer, um, in this case, a buyer of technology products or services, but also where on the process, as shown in the columns, that these start to have an impact. And the dots that you can see in this diagram, and there'll be similar diagrams like this in the following slides, um, represents cases where that is a driver of somebody's purchase decisions. So as an example, as when somebody goes from the point of not considering a band to researching it and entering some kind of consideration set, the ability of that brand to meet a company's minimum uh, quality or functional requirements is really important, as is, for instance, being competitively priced, as is something that other um, that's perhaps, might, perhaps might be considered a hygiene factor, which is taking steps to mitigate risks. Now, what's notable about the ones that I've flagged up on screen here, the, the ingredients that we can see, is that these are things that tend to impact at all stages of the decision-making process, um, not just in terms of the initial purchase, but also importantly post-purchase as somebody moves towards repurchasing, perhaps after a year's contract or something like that. So many of those are to do with reliability factors, as we might expect. But what's telling is that there are some of these preeminence factors coming into play. The extent to which particularly that thought leadership is important at all points in the journey is really quite a notable thing. It's very often thought that content or thought leadership is something that a, a brand would present to a buyer um, at the very top of the funnel uh, as almost a lead generation exercise. Actually, what this research is telling us is that this is really important at all points in the process, um, that you need to demonstrate your experience and your ability to um, be a leader in your market in terms of thoughts and innovation, um, whatever point in the process somebody is at. And then the final point, which we shall come back to in later sections, is the increasing expectation amongst B2B buyers that the brands that they're working with have a very clear vision and they're actually actively working towards fulfilling their obligations to society. This isn't necessarily about the detailed um, actions that they are taking, but rather it is um, the extent to which brands have been able to express a vision for what it is that they're going to be doing to make the world a better place. And that, interestingly, just like thought leadership, is something that buyers of B2B products and services, including technology products and services, are expecting throughout the entire customer journey. It isn't a point in time that this needs to be important or looked at. So that tells us what's important. Um, we then are able to overlay on top of that the extent to which 
buyers or brands within the technology space are actually delivering against buyers' expectations. So this is the scoring exercise that I described earlier and the extent to which companies are having their needs fulfilled. You can see here a lot of green dots for some of our reliability factors um, and several yellow dots um, for the preeminence superpower factors that we can see at the bottom. Um, this, of course, tells us that there's a lot of room uh, still to be done, still a lot of work still to be done in terms of those preeminence factors. But your eye may be drawn to the fact that the key area of underperformance on some of the, uh, these particular ingredients within the superpowers relates to the extent to which um, products and services in the tech space are competitively priced. We actually think that this has got a lot to do with the extent to which brands are bold about some of the claims that they are making about the extent to which the price is justified, the expression of value that they're putting out into the marketplace. So this comes down to things like the extent to which um, uh, buying a solution will save them time, the extent to which buying a solution will have productivity gains, and being able to make very clear claims and uh, put clear numbers to some of those points. That is we think the key area of underperformance that many brands in the tech space have still yet to deliver upon. So those are kind of the evergreen issues, those that are at all points in the purchase process. We then move on to eight other ingredients that are highly specific to the technology sector. Uh, and this again is across all of our subsectors that we looked at, including software, hardware, uh, telecoms, and so on. And what you can see here as we work through the purchase process is that the dots tend to read from left to right as we go through the more company-related superpowers through to the more personal-related superpowers. In other words, what starts out um, in technology purchases as being relatively impersonal to the extent that it's mainly company factors that are considered, um, it becomes progressively more personal as somebody gets further along the purchase journey. And in particular, when somebody has been acquired as a customer uh, and is thinking about repurchasing with a tech brand, um, so it is the case that it is very, very personal. Um, the things that make a difference to buyers um, at the repurchase step tend to be within our enrichment and our preeminent superpowers. It perhaps suffices just briefly to go through some of the things that are really impactful to tech buyers, though, during this process. So we can observe that, first of all, um, when somebody is researching brands, it's very important that they are supported with expertise at that point. And this is even before the point at which a brand is actually formally contacted. Our interpretation of this is that buyers increasingly have expectations in terms of receiving expert help and, and viewpoints from brands um, through mechanisms such as chatbots, through things like smart marketing automation uh, systems, um, through also the extent to which brands are present um, in other watering holes that somebody might be hanging out in as a buyer. So it might be support forums, it might be um, other communities that uh, tech buyers tend to hang out in. Um, the extent to which brands are able to help with expertise at that pre-purchase point, that zero moment in the process, we think is increasingly important. As we cycle on to the research stage and through to the point at which a brand might be invited to um, submit a quote or a proposal um, in the technology market, we see that um, understanding of companies' needs, and particularly that point to do with cultural understanding, becomes really, really important. We can see here also the fact that having the right sorts of products and services is also vital within the technology space. This is classic, um, having the right SKUs, the right tiers, the right add-ons available. Um, this is the sort of thing that somebody is considering again, even before they're asking for that formal quote or proposal. And then as we get to the point at which um, somebody's gathered in all of their quotes, um, they're making a selection between, probably in most cases, between just two or three brands that um, have reached that point in the process, things that tend to make a difference are more personal. Um, so it's the extent to which somebody feels safe personally signing with that particular brand. And also this critical point that I drew attention to earlier about making somebody's life, working life more enjoyable. Given the choice between two brands um, at that final point in the purchase process, 
the one that expresses a more fun, jovial um, uh, image to the, the buyer is the one that tends to win. It is perhaps in many ways the most critical factor, given that many others will be very, very close. And then finally, when we look at the repurchase step, this final point in the process, um, the two that I'll probably draw your attention to in the technology market that we think are important are, first of all, the extent to which um, brands are able to react to customization requests. Clearly, many brands, when they've been working with a customer for 12 months or more, should have been able during that period to have collected an awful lot of intelligence about the behaviors, about the requirements, about the preferences of that particular customer organization. And buyers increasingly expect that to be reflected back in terms of the offer that they receive at that first renewal, that first re repurchase process. Really important for us to be able to get that right as technology brands, and that's why we've drawn that out as a dot there to express the extent to which it's driving decisions. And then finally, this point to do with having a progressive approach to all stakeholders. Um, in technology markets specifically, the point of the process that, that comes across most strongly is at that repurchase step. Once a buyer has had an experience of the brand, they've learned a lot about it, they've seen um, the, it walk the walk as opposed to just talk the talk, that is the point at which they are most willing to use that as a reason to either continue with that customer relationship or that they're going to abandon that customer relationship. And if we just cycle on again to look at the ways in which brands are delivering upon those expectations, we can see, generally speaking, the key areas of underperformance. And it is on those more personal factors for the most part. It's about making people's lives more enjoyable and also that progressive approach to stakeholders where we have to be um, honest in saying that most technology brands are not necessarily delivering right now. So that's the current experience that people are seeing. And I'll pass across briefly to Gavin, who will be leading us through some examples of where brands uh, may be hitting the mark um, at the moment and what we can learn from it. Super. Thanks, Oliver. Um, there's many ways to look at how brands are actually performing on the ground um, and across the superpowers. But what I wanted to do today was really hone in on one superpower, preeminence, and one ingredient, which is have a progressive approach to all stakeholders, because it's an area that um, typically uh, tech brands underperform in. So I wanted to show an example of a brand, a tech brand that's doing uh, very well here, uh, who's Dell. Um, it's also an area that's especially pertinent right now. Um, uh, DEI agenda has uh, really become uh, important over the course of the last year. Uh, with very good reasons, so and we're, we're really seeing brands starting to step up here. Um, but as you can see, Dell does extremely well here, and have taken you know a, a DEI agenda, this uh, uh, how they approach all their stakeholders beyond just internal policies and things like that. So you can see how it um, goes into things such as how they look at innovation about making a positive difference to everyone how that goes into their um, their mission and, and purpose statement about creating a positive and lasting impact on humankind and the planet and seeing that and immediately view a be, that being an inclusive vision and how that impacts lots of the di different types of stakeholders that come into uh, contact with Dell. Um, in the bottom, we're seeing that, you know, that takes in from their external partners uh, through to their internal education, uh, employees, and um, other areas such as healthcare, and how we get there. So that internal journey that we're, we're doing it. So just, I wanted to show a really simple example, um, honing in on one, one of those things to actually how brands can start approaching these uh, different ingredients under each of the superpowers and start to really sort of say, how can we celebrate that? How can we make that? Uh, a really optimum point for us in, in, the, in the buyer journey. Um, so if that gives one example, uh, uh, hand back over to Oliver, who will take us through some sub-vertical differences. Thanks, Gavin, for that example. So, yeah, um, I mentioned earlier on in the um, in the meeting today that we'd have some sub-vertical uh, results. So we've talked so far in general about the technology sector, um, but what does that look like for some of our sub-verticals? 
But what I've done here is to just pick out a few of those key um, ingredients that we reviewed on some of the previous slides to show how the experience may differ um, between the four major sub-verticals that we have within the technology market. Um, so we see um, with the red triangle, the telecom sector, we see with the um, orange circle, um, the hardware market, this, this might be PC manufacturers, uh, printer manufacturers, those sorts of organizations. Um, software as a service uh, and software companies being shown in yellow diamonds. And then finally, uh, the blue squares being the CSPs, the cloud services providers who are dominating all aspects of business and all aspects of our consumer lives increasingly. And what we can see here is um, some of the different differential performance that we get between those sub-verticals. One key observation that you'll make is that um, telecoms firms are a little bit more behind the curve than is the case perhaps for those um, CSPs or IT services and cloud service provider organizations. There's a big gap in terms of the level of performance on things like supporting with expertise in terms of strong cultural and business goal alignment, and also on the topic of being active thought leaders in a particular category or sector. So clearly, the telecom sector is somewhat more of a traditional player within technology markets, um, does have room to catch up, um, but can learn, we think, from some of the examples that um, these other aspects of the technology industry um, put forward to us here. Uh, we can see in general that um, the tech sector average um, is relatively a high one. And actually, one key finding from our results more generally is that some of our highest performing brands that we were able to pick out from the results did indeed tend to be technology vertical brands. Um, but we can see some areas where tech uh, technology uh, vertical brands are not doing quite so well across all of our sub verticals. So an example of that might be around making somebody's lives a little bit more fun or entertaining, um, you know, classically, it is difficult for brands to be able to deliver against that, and tech is no exception. CSPs seem to be doing a little bit better than that than the general majority of other technology verticals, such as hardware and software as a service. Um, so clearly, what we can start to use these results for is to diagnose where within your particular markets there are gaps, and also to highlight examples of very high performance in, in your market or in your um, general area of business uh, so that we can see what it is that we should be doing to achieve uh, better returns, better delivery upon some of those experiences. So this is really just a, a taster, I would say, of the uh, ways in which we can start to slice and dice the data uh, to provide further insights. Also in the area of further insights is wanting to understand a little bit more about not just optimizing current experiences, which is what we've been looking at so far, but also the extent to which there are opportunities for brands to do something completely different, um, what we're saying to be opportunities for disruption. And because we've done this research across a variety of different sectors, um, we can see instances where, for instance, within the manufacturing verticals, we, we see an example of a brand doing something well and using it as a mechanism to drive purchase decisions that we could transport across and use, for instance, within the technology sector. So we'll be reviewing now just some of those opportunities for disruption that we think may be relevant to technology brands. So here, once again, we can see across our four superpowers and across all of our different points in the journey, what we consider to be some of those possibilities for disruption. We're not saying that they're definitely the right ones for your brand, but certainly they're food for thought as to how we might be able to use some of those examples from other markets and apply them to, to our everyday day-to-day -day work. So we can see here, for instance, examples um, such as um, the extent to which brands are able to make bolder claims about some of the cost improvements that they, they're able to deliver. So as an example, the extent to which um, working with a brand is able to reduce their costs or to improve their productivity or to help them save time or other resources is, in our observation, not something that is driving too many decisions in the tech space at the moment. But if we were to draw an analogy with uh, something like the manufacturing sector, clearly the adoption of a particular brand of raw materials or a particular, uh, I don't know, lubricant supplier or something else, which is in the very nuts and bolts of the manufacturing process, 
there does have to be in those cases very clear demonstration of the productivity improvements that would ensue. And this clearly is um, a, a, um, a call to arms to the tech industry to do better in this respect. Um, and we think there are opportunities to do better for many brands, particularly those who are selling things that are, in, in many ways, supposed to improve productivity. That, that, of course, is one of the major reasons for adopting tech in the first place. We can see also that there are expectations around having much more smoothly integrated offers, particularly at that point in the process where somebody is going from selecting a brand, um, so they've accepted a proposal, through to being onboarded as a customer. And very often, um, brands in other markets are putting a lot, of, um, a lot of investment into making that as smooth as possible. So if we look to look at something like the utility sector, um, clearly there's lots of switching that takes place in that sector, and they place a lot of store by wanting to make those switching experiences as easy as possible. Well, there's actually very analogous instances in tech markets, particularly B2B tech markets. Somebody might be moving from one marketing automation platform to another. Um, they want to have reassurance that that's going to be a smooth transition if they're going to make that transition. This is why this ends up being an area of really key importance for building those ultimate experiences. As we start to look through to some of the more personal value add superpowers, the enrichment and preeminence areas, we can see interestingly that there are some other levers that we can start to pull, particularly on the enrichment side of things that aren't delivered quite so much at the moment within technology markets. So as an example here, um, the extent to which brands keep uh, an individual buyer up to date and actually makes them more employable um, is a key area of um, competition, we think, increasingly in tech markets. There are signs of brands such as Salesforce doing really well in, in this area, um, you know, through their Trailhead and um, uh, Trailblazers initiatives. They're actually actively taking on the role of being the sort of brand that helps their customers, their users, in fact, not just the decision makers, um, to become more employable. And that they're very actively involved in that process through those two um, communities and initiatives. Um, and then finally, the extent to which um, the buyer is uh, assisted through the process uh, in terms of making that internal sell that I alluded to earlier is another key area that we think that there are disruption opportunities for tech brands. In other words, the sorts of sales and uh, uh, collateral and sales enablement collateral that's provided to the internal seller within the organization is often underappreciated. And again, that starts to manifest very clearly at that final stage of the process in other sectors. So again, I'll draw your attention to the manufacturing sector where many brands have lots of face-to-face -face interaction with the internal seller, the person who's recommending it to their budget holder or to their superiors. Maybe there are some things that we can learn within the technology sector that are analogous to that. And there's also some uh, very important things related to being uh, approachable and transparent during the purchase process that Gavin's going to briefly talk to us about with another of our examples. Super, thanks. What I wanted to do here was, I think, especially in tech, we're very used to quite large-scale digital, dis digital disruption, where a, a new uh, form, so think of your Ubers and your um, Spotify's and, uh, uh, and your Airbnb's, where we completely disrupt a sector. But I wanted to show here that actually doing something just differently and maybe borrowing uh, from other sectors can be just as disruptive. Um, I've highlighted IBM. Um, there's the old adage, nobody ever gets fired for hiring IBM. Um, and you would think, therefore, that they're, they'd probably think themselves quite safe in that purchase journey in terms of confirming and, and sort of landing and, and doing that conversion would be a safe area for them. Um, but sort of highlighting back to what Oliver um, highlighted um, earlier in the, in the session today about you know, pricing being quite problematic across the sector, IBM have disrupted um, and done something very different by making all of their uh, pricing and, uh, and payment structure incredibly transparent, something that's typically unseen uh, within the sector. So from everything from different subscription models to uh, special offers and discounts uh, through to learning subscriptions, all these sort of things taking through, IBM has sort of made 
everything as transparent as possible. Completely disrupts uh, the, the 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 sector. Um, I don't think you'll see any other uh, tech sector uh, brand coming as transparently with their pricing. Usually, it's very much you know you need to get in contact with that brand and start that journey. IBM recognizing uh, pricing is is an issue in the sector. Also recognizing that most B two B buyers have shortlisted um, their their uh, possible vendor list long before contacting any possible supplier um, have really put the effort here to, to disrupt and do things differently to ensure uh, that uh, conversion at point of, uh, point of sale. So if that's a, a, an area that some, somebody's disrupting in a really simple but really effective way, um, think about how you can start to disrupt in the different areas that you may be underperforming or wanting to do something different uh, to the rest of the sector. So that gives an overview of the superpowers and what they can do for you, um, and some of the uh, some of the sort of insights that have gone into it, and how that can be formulated for you. Um, they are, you know, quite broad in some ways. We've got thirty different ingredients split into four uh, different superpowers, but that gives them real strength and flexibility in being able to pinpoint exactly what your needs are, what you can do and how you can start bringing these in to inform your brand and how you can uh, sort of position yourself in market. So four key real points here. Um, the first, you know, we've got four uh, broad superpowers, two in that company area, so reliability and understanding things that um, we look for in terms of making sure it's a good choice for a company. And then two, in terms of our enrichment and that preeminence is, it's a good choice for me. I'm going to enjoy uh, doing that as well. Um, secondly, you know, we've got that shared ingredients list uh, that forms the touch points across that journey, and we can start looking at those specific levers. So taking from the four uh, to the full ingredient list gives us those levers that we can, as individual brands, start to uh, 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 dial up and down. Um, thirdly, you know, all of our buyers' needs differ, um, but this, you know, we've got the ability to mine that data and show the evidence of of the experience of where that it differs across the journey. Um, it comes from a large data set of 5,000 journeys. Uh, so there's a, a 3,000 uh, respondents with 5,000 brand journeys that are uh, being done. So it's a rich data set that is coming from. Um, fourthly, Within that, we have a lot of brand data, so your brand may be included in this, and if not, we can uh, look at uh, things to help identify how your brand performs within those category benchmarks, which then, to our fifth point, allows you to sort of form some strategies around how you can uh, shape your resources. Um, today, we looked at two of those, of how you could optimize within the category or do a step change and disrupt the category, but there's many other um, strategies that can be formed uh, when when sort of taking in the superpowers, the ingredients to those, and looking at your brand and how you can make a difference with that. So I hope that gives a really uh, nice introduction and a, a sort of a story through um, where we've been going over the over the course of the last little bit with that with the research and the stories that are starting to come out out from that. Um, I'm going to hand back over to. Z uh, Zoe now, who will lead uh, the Q&A uh, part of the session. Great. Thank you, Gavin. Um, and thank you also to Oliver and Danielle for sharing today's content with us. It does look like we've received several questions. Um, as a reminder, if you do have any um, remaining questions, you've still got time to submit them through the Q&A icon on your screen. So let's jump into them. Um, Danielle, I'm going to throw this first question to you. Um, do you have any further examples of how you have used this research framework to help clients? Yeah, Zoe, that's a great question. So one of the formats that we've seen this research work really great in is a workshop format. So what we'll do is we'll get a handful of client stakeholders across different divisions of uh, their marketing team. So digital experience, paid media, um, content, and a 
uh, try to find those key stakeholders within a client that know their messaging and their current go-to-market plan. And then we'll do a workshopping session where we have Miro boards and we have the team spend the first half of the workshop brainstorming the ways that they compare uh, to uh, like how they can win the categories and the ingredients and what winnable areas they have, where they do well and potentially where they don't do well. And then as a second part of that workshop, we'll actually look at it against the data to say, hey, here's some winnable places for X brand uh, when it comes to the ingredients. And here's where you're currently underperforming and overperforming. And how can we actually take those types of messages out through your touch points and digital experiences to clients? So we walk away with some real takeaways in terms of here's what our brand does well. Here's some touch points and experiences in which we can infuse that messaging. And here's a testing strategy to start to bring that to market. Uh, and typically what we find is that we walk away with three or four takeaways. Um, in a most recent workshop that I did with a tech client, they realized that they needed to humanize uh, and become uh, more uh, emotionally relatable by storytelling. And it goes back to that example about Dell. So a lot of these companies are doing uh, community service projects, are increasing DNI efforts, but maybe that's not what's leading their marketing efforts. So bringing that to the forefront of their communications and identifying the right experiences and channels to tell those stories will help brands start outperforming their competitors. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Danielle. Um, that's some great insights there. Um, okay, so another question that's come in. Um, at what point in the purchase journey that you showed earlier are tech buyers mainly dropping out? I'll perhaps take that one. So um, if I ca cast my mind back on that, I think the um, the, the sort of the, the main dropout point that we observed was kind of early on in the process, actually. Um, and I think we've known for, for many years that um, there's a huge amount of selection taking place at very early points in the purchase process, um, what classically has been referred to as, as the zero moments, the re basically the research phase and even areas before that. But we were very surprised when we looked into the data at the extent to which th there's just a huge amount of uh, filtering that's taking place at that point. Um, I think we had it something in the region of about 50% of um, all of the brands that are recalled um, by a particular buyer are actually rejected out of hand um, as being ones that they wouldn't ever consider or even look into further. Um, so there's a huge amount of um, pre-existing knowledge that people clearly have. Sometimes that's from their B2B experiences, sometimes that's from um, consumer experiences or even just things that they've heard from, from other colleagues. Um, the evidence that we have from this research, though, is that that filtering process is taking place at um, increasingly early points in the process. Um, the other observation or the area of leakage w w that we thought was quite interesting um, was also the extent to which uh, many buyers of B2B products and services, including in the tech space, um, simply wouldn't be moved on the idea that they would uh, do anything other than just purchase what they'd already purchased previously from that brand. So the opportunities for cross and upsell for many tech brands are, are huge. Um, you know, there are requirements, um, there are single sourcing opportunities that many organizations are looking at increasingly. And there is the ability for many tech brands to be able to fulfill uh, many of the increasing uh, diverse opportunities that buyers are expecting them to, but they're going unrealized. And that very often is just simply a case of educating and informing the customer that those sorts of services exist. But it is also crucially about the extent to which brands are delivering meaningfully um, on the, the purchase process and whether that experience really is the ultimate one. If it's not, then the extent to which you'll um, trust that brand with a greater share of your wallet um, is going to be much more limited. So a, a couple of points. It's really the, the, the front end of the process and the, the very final part of the process, the repurchase part of the process, where we see, I guess, the greatest leakage. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Oliver. Um, oh, so this is an interesting question that's come in. Are there any differences between the different types of buyer, for example, millennials versus boomers, um, or levels of seniority, for example? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I can probably answer that one uh, based upon the research that we've uh, we've done in this space. So. Um, 
one slide that I didn't get the opportunity to share today, but which is in um, the, the wider report, um, are some observations that we've made about the behaviours of millennial buyers versus older generations of buyers. And I, I think a lot has been written about this subject without there being too much hard evidence behind it. Um, I guess one of the great strengths of the superpowers framework is that it's entirely inferred. So by looking at the ratings that people are giving and looking at the extent to which those drive somebody along the purchase journey, we can say what's important. Um, there's some very clear areas where things that are important to millennials are not important to boomers. So one of them, for instance, is the extent to which um, their work is made more enjoyable is a really key driver, especially, I should say, within the tech space not just uh, actually to millennial purchase decision makers, but also to Generation X. Um, they seem to also be motivated by that point. And as we identified earlier, it's a key point that m many technology brands don't deliver upon. Uh, the other observation is as somebody works through their career and through their, the, the, I guess, the life stages, um, is that value exchange is more and more expected from brands, and particularly in the area of skills exchange. So the extent to which a tech brand, as an example, is able to augment somebody who's perhaps in their 40s or 50s with new skills that help them to go on to the next stage of their career, to perhaps reskill and to go down a slightly different line in their career path, um, is increasingly expected. You know, if I'm going to work with you as an organization, as a brand, what can you do for me personally is one of the key observations we'd make. And that interacts very clearly with somebody's life stage. And then the final one um, that we, we observed, um, again, in general, but also particularly within the tech space, is that um, older um, decision makers are kind of missing out from many of the face-to-face -face events that would historically have taken place. So COVID has obviously put a spanner in the works there. And one of the, the main um, values that many older decision makers got out of working with vendors was um, the extent to which it would help them build their personal network, you know, meet new people, experience new things. Um, brands are going to have to think about how they substitute that in for that sort of audience um, in a future that may be based upon more virtual events as opposed to face-to-face -face events. So a few considerations there, again, all relevant to the tech space about um, generational differences. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Oliver. And for those of you interested in the general, generational differences in the resources tab, we did do a webinar earlier in January that talks about this. So um, check out um, that link to learn more. Um, I think we have time for one final question that we can squeeze in. Um, so let's see. Um, how can I identify where my own brand would sit within this framework? Uh, super, yeah, I can grab that one because I'm doing some work with uh, some brands on that right now. Um, so overall, as we were saying, there, you know, there was 5,000 uh, brand journeys uh, that uh, have been looked at in this. So we've got a list of over 100 uh, brands. Um, so very many time uh, working with clients that are already identified on that list or we can find uh, them within that so we can find some data about you, your company, and it's already there. Um, the other really powerful part about uh, about this and working, working with us is actually being able to complement and use the superpowers research to help drive uh, your own research um, uh, uh, pr program, what you go out and ask, and we can put together a research, a party research uh, thing, incorporating the super, superpower questions out to your audience and bring that data in, complemented by, you know, the already large database and all the raw data there, and come up with some really interesting, bespoke, dead on you uh, results out of this. So. We can take that really nice broad uh, 5,000 things, hone those in with through the 100 brands and the uh, sector and subsector stuff that Oliver's taken us through today, and then really um, almost you know pimp that up uh, with some proprietary research around you or yours that just completely zippers in uh, with the superpowers. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Gavin. 
Um, okay, so that's all the time we have for questions today. For those that we didn't get um, to answer, um, we will follow up with you. Um, if you're interested in attending any of the other industry deep dive sessions, um, we're going to be covering professional services, manufacturing, and financial services this week and next. Um, a link to register for the series will pop up on your screen in a few seconds. And as a reminder, you'll receive an email from us with a link to this webinar recording in the next few days. I'd like to thank our speakers again for sharing all the insights of this research for the technology center sector and to thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.